Shadow Talk. It's another episode of Shadow Talk. In this week's episode, Neckers in a Twist, a new distribution method for Drydex malware emerges. Dark Caracal Group emerges, but who's behind it for real? And reporting on neuron malware strikes a nerve. We'll also be chatting about gas pumps, ski jumps, and data dumps, all in this week's Shadow Talk. Here to wrestle with this week's stories, we've really got the Triple H from Digital Shadows. With me is Harrison Van Riper. How's it going, Michael? Very well, thank you. We've got Harriet Groon. Harriet, happy Australia Day to you. Thanks, Mike. Cheers. No worries. And we've got Rick Holland himself. Hello, Rick. Hello, Mike. We went for some rather nice barbecue yesterday, didn't we? Team outing, Pecan Lodge in Dallas. Highly recommended. Beef ribs to die for. So let's start off this podcast by looking at the Drydex malware. And Harrison, there's been a new distribution tactic for Drydex. Let's start at the top. What exactly is Drydex and who should be concerned about it? So Drydex is a banking trojan that's been around for quite some time now, um, usually targeting, uh, trying to harvest credentials, essentially. So uh, financial institutions, financial banks, and uh, banking users should really be uh, concerned with a banking malware like this. Yeah, and how is it normally distributed? And what's this new method that's being observed? Yeah, you usually see it being spread through spam email campaigns, uh, you know, in different um, PDFs and, you know, payloads in different Word documents. Uh, you know, when you enable macros, it downloads the, um, the payload for Didex. So different, different spam campaigns, usually it's a distribution method that we see. Sure. And these types of campaigns tend to target specific geographies. On this one, are there any ones that stand out in particular? So this specific campaign was observed targeting um, top-level domains in France, the United Kingdom, and Australia. So, you know, a little bit different uh, observed geographies, but Drydex has been known in the past to target a wide variety of different geographies. Targeting Australia near to Australia Day, that's yeah. just not cricket. It's not cool. No, exactly. So if you are a financial services company in those particular regions that you say, or a customer of that bank, this is probably pretty relevant for you. If you are that company, what should you be concerned about and how can you protect yourself? Sure. So one of the one of the potentially simple ways to kind of combat this would be to disable macros within uh, Word documents, because since, again, that's usually a common distribution method for a banking trojan like this. I know that Rick has some other thoughts about that, but that is a potentially simple way to combat this. When I hear people use the word simple uh, to describe a countermeasure to a particular attack vector, I really want to bash my head into the table because from a practitioner's perspective, and I certainly see this here as the CISO, you know, there is nothing that is simple. Uh, for our listeners out there, very large organizations and many Digital Shadows customers, Fortune 100 multinationals, to say disable macros to an organization of that size is not simple. And it extends down to very small organizations as well. I think what you'll find when you disable macros or you take other air quote simple uh, security countermeasures, you can really impact the business. So I'm not saying that you don't want to dis disable macros, but you need to be absolutely prepared for processes that you didn't know about becoming broke, uh, you may actually do more business, more harm to your business through disabling a macro than perhaps a particular piece of malware would do. So this is why things like change control, change control management, change control board are really important so that people know that we're gonna make this change through our configuration patch management uh, tool stack, um, and then have an ability to very quickly uh, identify and have people report problems when they need to have a document that needs to have a macro because you need to communicate with a third party uh, through that macro uh, to be able to identify and quickly remediate and make exceptions. So you better be prepared to break processes and then quickly identify and fix them. Awesome. Obviously, harvesting of information isn't always financially motivated. And this week, there's been some new activity from this new espionage group called Dark Caracal. Harriet, Who's this group and what have they been getting their claws into? Yeah, so thanks, Mike. So there's been a big report released last week about Dark Caracal, which has been tied by the researchers who did the reporting to the Lebanese government. Um, basically, they made this association because they found an exposed command and control uh, domain, which data had been exfiltrated to 
which had some uh, test devices on it, which had Wi-Fi networks that then could be tracked to the Lebanese security services building. And also some of the aliases used in the campaigns had uh, addresses linked to the country. There was some reporting on a new site yesterday, which uh, contained some statements from Lebanese officials, which they didn't uh, explicitly deny it. Um, it's, it is pretty unsurprising that any government really conducts surveillance activity. We did see uh, with previous exposure of, of a tool called Finn Fisher, the governments from everyone from Angola to Slovenia was using it. In terms of the data that they were gathering, so they basically were obtaining data from both Android devices and using desktop malware as well. So they were basically getting everything from contacts, SMS messaging, getting intellectual property documents um, and pretty much everything that you could obtain from a mobile phone. So they didn't use any zero day exploits that we're aware of, but they did seem to have developed some cost malware variants for both mobile phones and desktop malware. Um, so the campaign was quite effective when it had infected devices, although it was a little bit limited in scope. What was the scope? Were there, was there specific targeting of any particular industries or organizations? Yeah, so it was the diverse, it was very diverse in terms of the states that were targeted. So um, pretty much had everyone in there from Nepal to the Netherlands. It was probably a little bit inconsistent with what you might expect for a Lebanese espionage operation. So there wasn't a specific regional focus in the Middle East and countries like Iran and Israel were also not listed as targets, which are two countries that you might expect them to be conducting surveillance activity around. So the report also did cover some numbers of mobile devices uh, that they found on the C2 uh, domain, and it was limited to less than a thousand. They didn't really specify, and that's over a five year period as well, they didn't really specify the number of uh, desktop infections, but they did produce some graphs around the total amount of data, which was skewed slightly towards mobile devices. So it would appear likely that there were fewer infections on um, actual desktop machines. So of course, for both of these assessments about the country they targeted and the amount of data and the type of data, we are relying on information from two uh, con command and control hosts. So there's po it is possible that there are other domains which would hold further data, but relying on what we've got at the moment, that's what it looks like. So yeah, fairly limited in terms of the scope over a five year period. So what can organizations do about this area? Um, so for this campaign in particular, they were sort of looking, I guess the key takeaway is that they were targeting Android devices. And obviously the, the type of data stored on mobile phones makes them pretty valuable targets for both espionage actors and also financially motivated groups. So this campaign used a mixture of phishing messages on social media and secure messaging sites to then lead to a website hosting malicious applications that were impersonating legitimate services. And then those apps, if they were then downloaded, re uh, requested permissions from users. So the process actually had several steps before, before a device would be successfully infected. So the key takeaway from this campaign is definitely around the area of mobile device security. And given the research that we've done here at Digital Shadows as well internally, it's definitely important to not only kind of focus on downloading apps from the official app stores, but really taking care with accessing links on social media and secure messaging platforms. And definitely for company devices, uh, things like mobile device management programs can uh, help prevent access to non-official sites and downloads. And also for our full service clients, we do conduct um, mobile monitoring as part of our service. So definitely for our clients, make sure that all your uh, C data is configured correctly. So to stay in the kind of cellular threat space, but let's talk about neurons instead and this update to neuron malware. Harrison, last week you talked about Turler and who, who's tied to the neuron malware. Do you want to remind people who Turler is? Yeah, so Turler is a uh, espionage group that's been observed in the past, um, believed to be a Russian state actor. This week we reported on an update to one of their uh, neuron malwares, and I think Harriet knows a little bit more about that than I do. Yeah, okay, so this is quite an interesting uh, piece of reporting and an interesting update. So the uh, advisories around the neuron malware were, were kind of released both in November 2017 and then also one was released uh, last week. So the malware is attributed to Turler because it was seen in campaigns also using the snake rootkit, which is a tool that's thought to be specific to the Turler group. Um, so basically in November, uh, the NCSC produced quite a big, a lengthy report on the group and on the malware with kind of extensive Yara rules, which can be used to detect malware. 
And the second advisory that was released last week said that the neuron malware was updated shortly after this first uh, reporting to better kind of hide its activity and make those previous detection rules ineffective. Um, we definitely can't say for sure that Turler is monitoring, you know, public reporting to steer changes in their operations. It may be a combination of them looking at sort of what's being said about them, but also probably monitoring their campaigns and whether they're still being effective or not. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's not the first time that Neuron was reported publicly. So uh, Malwarebytes did some reporting on it in early 2017, but that reporting didn't really cover the same le level of detail that the NCSC report did. So it's potential, there's potential that organizations that uh, probably run better detection scans for it and potentially um, kind of disrupted activity. But really, there's still quite a lot of unknowns around this campaign and, and the timing of why they updated the, updated the malware. But I think the main point from this incident is really demonstrating the fluidity of the threat landscape. So actors are constantly updating tactics and detection avoidance techniques um, across a variety of campaigns. So we've seen this as well with actors using cloud-based infrastructure for uh, C2 communications and trusted sites to avoid detection, um, constantly updating different ways that they can maintain network persistence. So yeah, that's the main takeaway from this, I'd say. I was going to ask about what organizations can do, but do you reckon that, that covers it? Yeah, I think definitely it's really useful to kind of use detailed threat intelligence to help build a picture of the type of uh, actors that are affecting your sector, the different tactics, techniques, and procedures that they're likely to use to infiltrate your network. So using things like lots of public reporting, different intelligence feeds, uh, Yara rules as well, which are really helpful for an organization to then detect, try to detect if the malware is active on your system. And of course, monitoring infrastructure for any intrusion, intrusion attempts can help organizations kind of start to take a bit more proactive approach to the threats they might face going forward. Thanks, Harriet. Um, just staying with Russian-based actors for the meanwhile, um, just a quick update on the Olympics as well. We've seen the Fancy Bears hack team um, probably leaking some more documents. It's all gone downhill as the International Luge Federation has some documents leaked with their drug tests there. Um, also in the Russian space, we've got activities relating to Cozy Bear or APT29, some reporting around the Dutch authorities there. Rick, what's the latest on that? Yeah, it's an interesting lesson on intelligence sharing. Apparently, uh, Dutch intelligence services had access to Cozy Bear um, who of course is involved in targeting the US, not nearly as uh, destructive as Fancy Bear is, however. Um, interesting thing to note is they actually had access to their physical security cameras and were able to record Russian actors going in and out of the building there. Um, when I try to distill what this means to organizations, you know, not everyone out there is gonna be a target of nation state espionage actors. Uh, regardless of what country they're from. What, what I think is an important lesson here for us as defenders of our own environments is really around intelligent sharing because what happened in this, or what has been reported by the media in this case is the Dutch shared with the National Security Agency about the access that they had. And like we have seen with the current administration, there's been a lot of leaks. So this story came out and essentially that burned, uh, burned a relationship between Dutch intelligence and United States intelligence. So if you're a defender and you run a threat intelligence organization, I think it's really important to understand when someone gives you something that is TLP red, it really is TLP red. And if you share that information, you could burn a peer organization's collection capabilities. You could certainly burn your relationship uh, between the person that shared that intelligence with you or as we have these trusted vetted sharing communities, if things that are TLP red that make it into those, um, that then there's a joke around, you could say something as TLP New York Times or TLP Washington Post, meaning it was shared in a private community and then makes it out to the media, is gonna make people less inclined. So it's really important when someone gives you something in confidence that you don't share that information because essentially it lowers, lowers, lowers the boats for everyone. It makes it much more difficult to, to band together against these adversaries, they really do have more capability and resources than us. So to me, once you get past the headlines of nation state on nation state and cool surveillance with security cameras, to me, the ultimate question for practitioners and defenders is when someone shares something with you, you need to share that internally only, keep their confidence. Otherwise, you're going to lose a critical collection capability that you have developed through a relationship. 
Another story, uh, not on bears, but still from the Russian neck of the woods, was about Russian fuel outlets. And there was a Russian criminal organization and the actor was actually arrested. And we've seen loads of stuff related to kind of fuel and gas stations to do with skimming and quite cool hardware that's been involved. But in this case, it was actually, uh, it was actually malware. And that was getting onto the gas pumps themselves and it was overcharging customers for more fuel than was actually delivered. So they were shorting customers between three and 7% per gallon of fuel pumped. And so across everywhere, whether it was the software on the pumps, the cash registers, and the backend system, they were supplying fake information uh, to the victims and then relied on the complicit insiders to actually overcharge them in that way. So although the attack was essentially foiled in the end, it was a quite cool adaption to, um, to what's normally skimming fraud. One thing I would add, for those uh, that are fans of the classic movie Office Space, you might recall the fraud that occurs in this movie with microtransactions reminds me of this kind of ATM skimming that's going on where they're taking a little bit on top of each deal and making lots of money. So uh, this is actually another example of things that we've seen in the criminal world for ages uh, that you see adapted to the cyber side of the house. The final thing I want to talk about is just a common theme we've seen this week, and that is the lack of multi-factor authentication. And this came about with the misconfiguration of Jenkins servers that was exposing sensitive information for multiple companies, and I think was accessible by Shodan. And then there were also lots of US media individuals that were targeted by Twitter phishing. Um, at least three accounts were targeted, and the campaign used these spoof Twitter logon pages. So it just reminds us that People don't use multi-factor authentication. Why not have multi-factor authentication? It's, it's easy, 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 Rick. Just like disabling macros, enabling multi-factor authentication can be quite a struggle for organizations as well. I think things get a little bit easier when you have SaaS applications that are getting fed into something like Okta, uh, where, or Ping, another one of those single sign-on solutions. It's much easier to have multi-factor authentication attached there versus 40 or 50 different SaaS applications. Uh, but I definitely think organizations need to look at external facing services uh, running that multi-factor authentication, especially their VPNs if people are coming in to the environment and then doing work on internal assets. But as we move to more and more SaaS applications, turning MFA on on things like Okta does make it a little bit easier. So let's wrap up by going to each of you and giving a key takeaway for what's happened this week. Harriet, with the Taylor campaign, what should we be thinking about? So basically, the key takeaway, I think, from this Taylor activity is that the threat landscape is really changing all the time. So actors across a variety um, of, that are doing a variety of campaigns are constantly updating their TTPs. And it's really important to kind of stay on top of the threat intelligence around that um, and keep kind of really aware of what's going on to make sure that you take a more proactive approach to security. Awesome. Mr. Holland, what's the update from you? I think one key takeaway across all the stories we've talked about today is there's no such thing as easy. And I think if going back to both the macros and multi-factor authentication, monitoring mobile applications, nothing's easy to do. And I think it's really important to set expectations as we're trying to deal with the threat landscape uh, that it's really going to take a concerted effort over time that there isn't one particular configuration, one particular solution that is going to mitigate our risks. And if we don't communicate that effectively up the chain of command to our stakeholders, we're really going to do ourselves a disservice and potentially shoot ourselves in the foot in the future. And Harrison, what about yourself? Yeah, so Drydex, you know, was being observed, being distributed via uh, FTP servers. So in order to combat against that, um, you know, obviously things like strong passwords, um, these specific credentials were exposed online. So, you know, kind of knowing your digital footprint and knowing uh, kind of what's out there would be a good way to kind of prevent against this. Also, um, network monitoring, um, things like IP whitelisting uh, can usually help identify uh, some, some kind of abnormal activity with these kinds of things. Great stuff. That's all for this week's Shadow Talk. Thank you everybody for joining. Thank you, Rick Holland. Dean Nada. Thank you, Harrison Van Riper. Thank you. And thank you, Harriet Grigg. No worries. Have a great week. That's a wrap. For more information on Digital Shadows research, visit resources.digitalshadows.com.